are making these results from Walgreens Boots Alliance. The drugstore chain reported this morning posting a clean top and bottom line beat, but management also lowered the high end of their full year earnings forecast, and they said they're taking an impairment charge in their Village MD business. More important, on the conference call, new CEO Tim Wentworth laid out his turnaround plans, which is what allowed the stock to rally more than 3% today. This potential comeback story is all about new leadership, so we are lucky that we get a chance to speak with the architect of the turn, Tim Wentworth, the CEO of Walgreens Boots Alliance. Take a look. Tim, I want to thank you, first of all, for coming on and what feels like kind of day one of the new Walgreens, where you're trying to simplify and strengthen. And I want to know what simplify and strengthen you think will look like over the next year. Well, Jim, uh, thanks for noticing, because uh, that's exactly what we're doing. Over the next year, uh, you will see us continue what we started today, which is, you know, today you saw us stop doing, uh, for all practical purposes, uh, sale leasebacks. Um, you saw us basically say our Sincora shares, we're going to sell those into the market as we, as we uh, move out of that position, rather than doing complex, variable, prepaid, forward sorts of uh, things. So some of it's on the accounting side, but more importantly, it's really getting focused operationally on the underlying parts of the business that are going to drive our future. And so, as I was able to announce today, uh, we ha we're knee deep, frankly, if not neck deep, in an analysis of our entire book of business uh, and the different pieces to look at what is going to drive our future growth, what gives us synergy, what is in a marketplace that we can win in. And if you can't answer those questions positively, what's the way to then exit our, our strategies in a way that's most effective for our shareholders? So a year from now, I think you're going to see a company that's even more focused, probably has a few less of the things that we have now, but also um, has doubled down on some things where we see a real bright future, including, and I think importantly, Jim, the retail store, the back of the store and the pharmacy, which today you heard is continuing to do well, and the front of the store as we continue to evolve sort of what that model has got to look like in order for us to win overall. Okay, well, let me give you a, a sense of what I get after I read the conference call. Obviously, it's a, a tough conference call to read. I'm trying so hard. I see a Chick-fil-A model of incredible service in the back where pharmacies where I want to go, and up front is your incredible private brands that you make a lot of money. I don't see a lot of Cheez-Its there. I don't see a lot of bad stuff for you, and I think that you are going to be the ultimate in terms of figuring out how the customer is going to get the best price for GLP-1 and everything else. How's that for a version? I think, uh, you know, if I were hiring a head of strategy, Jim, I'd uh, bring you on board because, uh, in fact, you know, what you just talked about is very much how we think about the business, which is, A, the back of the store. And listen, I love, my family loves Chick-fil-A. I've used them as an example of great service. Uh, we, we believe that that's something we're delivering today, which is why we are so successful both as a partner for a partner for pharma and as someone that people trust to actually give them the vaccines and, and the other things that we do at the back of the store. But if you come to the front of the store, uh, it's a process that we're in the middle of in terms of really relooking at the role of private labels. We launched almost 40 new private label products this quarter, for example. And as well, Jim, the service and the, I hate buzzwords, but the omni-channel experience for our users and something that we didn't talk about before, but I love to talk about, is that over 80% of our online orders, where you're home, you go to our app, you want some things from your Walgreens, are delivered over 80% within one hour. Wow. And so we've got a customer experience, whether you come into our store or whether you need something delivered to your home that's going to be unmatched. Well, I... I was my next question was going to be how are you going to beat Amazon? I don't have to worry about that because Amazon can't touch that. They can't. They can't go that fast. Congratulations. You know, Jim, let me tell you what. I love Amazon. They set the bar and they have driven lots of innovation in lots of industry. They have forced us. You know, would we be doing one hour delivery, but not for Amazon and Instacart and other things? I don't know. Uh, but what I can tell you is our consumers have been trained to expect better. We're giving it to them. And the difference, though, is because I don't think we'll beat Amazon because we're one hour and they're two or they're 10. We will beat Amazon because of the human interface that we offer in communities and neighborhoods, 8,600 locations today, uh, where you can come in if you actually are getting a drug that you want to talk about, if you have a health concern, if you want to get an over-the-counter uh, product to go along with your drug. Those are the things that I think are going to differentiate us, not just the fact we can do it in an hour. Okay, well, that means to me, Tim, that uh, right now when I go to a rival of yours, uh, uh, the uh, pharmacy, uh, sometimes they're closed, which I regard as odd because I need my medicine. 
uh, are we going to be able to see enough pharmacists at Walgreens that I know if I go there, I'm going to be treated actually by a pharmacist? Yes. And let me tell you why. First of all, we are actually working with a group of deans of uh, college pharmacy from around the country, 17 of them, to actually remap the workplace of the future in community pharmacy and then re-engineer curricula to actually deliver candidates to that, to that model. And we are going to be the preferred place for a pharmacist to come work. But secondly, we are removing massive amounts of work from the pharmacists that are low value work, whether that's counting pills using our micro fulfillment centers, or we have other experiments going on where in fact, you can actually see or talk to a pharmacist that's not in the store, even as you're in the store, in certain states where the law allows us to have centralized pharmacy like that, where we can take one person and make them very efficient, touching many stores uh, and the patients in those stores where they need counseling. So we think designing the workplace differently. We think designing work differently. We think engaging with the community that's creating tomorrow's pharmacists in a way that's constructive and as a leader are all going to position us to be able to have the workforce that we need to deliver what you would need when you come into the store. That's certainly not the way it is now. That would be terrific. Now, let's talk about Village MD. Let's talk about the so-called doc in the box, if we want to denigrate it, or convenient doctors want to be right. You're going to go, what, individual by individual alpha to see which ones are, are profitable, or is that is everything on the table? Because I know there's some big charges. Sure, sure. So you saw we took the charge this, this uh, quarter, which, again, I would differentiate Village MD from an investment that we've made, and that is worth less today than it was yesterday right. in terms of our balance sheet because we have, we have uh, written that down. But then there's the actual providing of the service, where, as I announced, they've actually had a good quarter, uh, grew by almost 19 percent. They continue to deliver on their model. And so we like very much working with them, alongside them, to capture the scripts, keep those patients' adherence that they're taking risk, uh, risk on, and so forth. And so from our perspective, while I've been very clear, we view it as an investment, we are not going to add to that investment in terms of where we deploy capital. But by the same token, we view them as a terrific sandbox to create additional services that are going to benefit other provider groups uh, as we move forward. In the meantime, what a gem this Boots is. Now, you got the front of the store doing incredibly well. I know, I think there were people who wanted you to give away Boots. Maybe Boots, 2000 store, maybe this thing is, maybe this thing is, the, is, is a store of the future. You know, Boots has responded to its unique marketplace terrifically. And, you know, you only have to, the reason I'm, one of the reasons I'm super confident about our front of the store kind of revival, I'll call it, is because once you focus on something and put really good people on it, you're going to get results if you've got the right strategy. Boots, five years ago, was not doing particularly well. And today, as you say, they are setting the benchmark in, in, uh, in the U.K. and in parts of Europe as it relates to what a retail pharmacy that's very front end uh, sort of centric can deliver. They've had phenomenal results. Their leadership is terrific. Um, and we, we, we saw them again. The, this, this, uh, this quarter grew again. So, yes, they are a model. Also, the back of their store doing now treating patients for seven different uh, uh, conditions, treating them, not just dispensing, but able to interface with the patient as a pharmacist, diagnose, write the prescription, oh. and take the load off the primary care physicians in the UK. This will take off, I forget the number, it's, it's more than 10 million visits that will now go away. And frankly, it's better for the patient, it's convenient, it doesn't threaten physicians. We see what's going on there as a really interesting dynamic that we can potentially replicate here as we push to have pharmacists viewed as true providers and reimbursed as true providers. Again, that would be amazing. Now, I didn't even talk about the thing that is, that is your strength, the express scripts, the, the way you're going to handle reimbursement. Mary Langowski, a huge coup. You are basically going to reinvent, I believe, how much we're going to have to pay as customers. Is that possible? I think so. And the good news is I think we will have willing partners in some of the PBMs and the payers to do it, Jim, because I think the noise from the market, the, the clear message from the market, set aside the regulatory stuff in Washington. Just the consumers and the people who pay for health care, they want it to work differently. And the good news is that will benefit us and it will benefit the payers when a patient actually goes into a drugstore and gets, comes into our store, gets what they expect at a price that they understand and that's transparent right. and that's close to what their plan is paying and is rational. Those are things that I think the pull from the marketplace 
uh, will actually exceed the push that we could ever do, and it's going to create a much better aligned system. All right, last question. Uh, you addressed shrink. You didn't give us a number, but can you make shrink to be something that you and I will not be talking about a year from now? We are going to work. We are working really, really hard to do that. And again, there are a number of pieces of, uh, to that. The one I would just double click on, Jim, is, you know, we talked about delivery to home in an hour just a moment ago. When we look at the stores that are really struggling, and again, you've got to break shrink into pieces. You've got this true organized crime element, and then you've just got pilfering, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the opportunity is, you know, shrink is not equal across all 80-some hundred of our stores, right? There are a, a subset of stores where we see it as an issue, and what we are able to do using home delivery, using potentially a different model inside the store, it may not be as good a shopping experience as if you just come into the, the, the open store that we may have in a suburban uh, corner. But by the same token, we'll be able to serve a community where it's a bit more challenging to do that in a way that's safe for the community, safe for our employees, and would reduce shrink meaningfully uh, by basically, I don't want to say locking the door of the store, but meaningfully managing the store experience more closely. And may I just say that I saw you in January at the J.P. Morgan conference where you had just come in, and your knowledge of this organization and what has to be done is just, I, I don't know how I can say anything other than this is just excellent what you brought to us. Excellent. Thanks, Jim. And I thank you so much. That's Tim Wentworth. He's the CEO of Walgreens Boots Alliance. I knew this man would come up with a solution. It's still a work in progress, but it's unbelievable. Thank you so much, Jim. We'll be back in a moment. After the break, fortune favors the sold? This corporate breakup spun gold for investors, but not in the way you might think. Kramer explains next. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Kramer on X. Have a question? Tweet Kramer. Hashtag Mad Mentions. Send Jim an email to madmoney at CNBC.com or give us a call at 1 800 743 CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com.